Well, 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 well. You're listening to Gloves Off with Professor Butron. All right then, I me say words on point, straight forward. No dream on job, but everybody forward. Issues, facts and solution. Get it at gloves off with Professor Mutron. All right, what other that thing is a revolution. Get it on point with Professor Mutron. Gloves off. No nonsense issues, politics, community. A better man for Laredo. Gloves off, a revolutionary show. With everything that you need to know. With Professor Mutron. Watch ya! Gloves off is always on point. On point. Bringing you the best on current issues, community affairs, and the happenings around us. This segment of Gloves Off is brought to you by the best. So pay them a visit. Check them out. This is Gloves Off. For 30 years, Buitron Academy has produced great fighters, peace officers, firemen, and many great citizens of Laredo. We teach various martial arts, savat. Kempo. Capoeira. Each in their own traditions, trajectory, history, and pedagogy. Buitron Academy is the first school of savat in the United States. The first capoeira movement in Texas, the first Kempo school in Laredo. What will one expect to see at Buitron Academy? Respect. Fellowship. Coordination. Skill. And self-defense. Throne Academy is located at 220 West Hillside Road. Political paid advertisements do not reflect the political opinions of the program or its associates. Any political campaign or candidate who wishes to purchase advertising can do so. Advertising is open to all on behalf of Gloves Off.
that was gloves off. And today we have a debate for the Webb County Justice of the Peace Precinct One Place One. I'll give a little briefing overview of what a Justice of the Peace is for people that are in power. Justice of the Peace have been in power or have been conferred to power since 1381. That was in England. That was the first court that was brought in colonial America. Before the state of Texas became a state, the Republic also had justice of the peace. Once the state became, it was no longer a Republic. Justice of the peace were the ones that maintained a majority of the order throughout. We can never forget Judge Roy Bean, who was once not only the judge, he was the juror and the executioner at the same time. But things have changed. And today, many Western states continue this practice of having a justice of the peace. In fact, in Texas, there's some counties that the justice of the peace is actually the busiest of all the courts. Okay? It is, it is uh, some of the powers both in Texas that are fine. And it is, number one, the justice of the peace is a constitutional office with origin state back, like I said, to the Texas Republic. They produce and they have a jurisdiction over all Class C offenses. And of course, also have a jurisdiction of minor civil matters. And these courts also have a small claims court. Right now, they say there's a limit of 10,000, but that is actually under controversy because in some counties, it is more court. Okay? But as a justice of the peace can issue arrest warrants, and also serve as a coroner for the many counties. And right now in Texas, there's only 13 counties that have a coroner in the West County one. The justices of the peace are elected for four-year terms, and they're elected by a constituents of the precinct. Now, there's certain jurisdictions and there's certain counties that it goes by populace. So the more people we have in the county, the more justice of the pieces we have in a county. Okay? And they all might, every year they have to complete 20 hours. So they always have to have a continual education. So it is an important office. It is, uh, it is the court of the people as many claim. I will explain the debate format for everybody to kind of have a consensus. Each candidate will have one minute to open and one minute to close. That the, the debate is divided into three segments, totaling of five questions. And everybody has basically one minute to answer each one. At the end, they'll have two minutes to rebuttal. Okay? So I'm going to introduce the candidates. And the first one that we'll start will be Mr. Juan Pai. And we'll go ahead and continue. You can step up and explain a little bit of who and why you want to be a justice in the peace Good morning. Thank you for having us. No, thank you for being us have this debate and for letting us share our ideas. Um, my name is Juan Paz, and I was born and raised here in Laredo. Um, my parents are Juan and Francisca Paz. Uh, they both have a, a, a business. They've been running a business for the past 53 years in our community. Um, I've been, I married my high school sweetheart and we've been together for 37 years. And we have one son who's in college and should graduate this year. And he's looking into pursuing a, a law degree as well. And um, I retired from the Laredo Fire Department. I was there for 27 years. I worked as a firefighter and a paramedic. Um, I went, I'm a product of Martin High School, LCC or LC now, and TAMU. I have a degree in political science. I'm a licensed paramedic as well. I'm a vehicle safety inspector also. And um, I want to make a difference in my community because I've been a lifelong resident. My family has had a business in the community and I want to make a positive change in my community. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paz. <laughs> All right. You 
you've heard Mr. Fox in his, in his opening statement, and our next one will be Ms. Mariana Morales. <laughs> Good morning to all. For the first time in 28 years, there will be a change in this court. There will be a new judge. The question is, what kind of a change do you want as voters? Do you want real change? Or do you just want another phase, but no real change in that court? I offer to the community real change. I have been an attorney for 42 years this year. It's a long time, sometimes longer than most of you have lived. But I offer to the community my experience as a mother. It's been quite a trip to have a, a kid at the age of 40. And know they do not keep you young, they keep you tired. But I can guarantee you that that has been, to me, my most the best accomplishment that I am so proud of my son, who is working outside the radar. I started my legal career at Legal Aid as a staff attorney, representing the poorest of the poor. Then I went on to City Hall, representing a governmental entity. Then I set up my own practice. I offer, yo le ofrezco mi corazón a la comunidad, le ofrezco mi experiencia como madre, les ofrezco mi experiencia como abogado, les ofrezco mi experiencia como una mujer de negocio. Tengo aproximadamente 38 años de tener mi propio negocio. And my plans for this board are real change. Innovate the office, have a website that is user friendly, put on that website the forms that are necessary for people to file lawsuits or to defend themselves in that court, in Spanish and in English. And what that means is that you would be able to go into the website, download a form, and get on with the business of sitting down in the privacy of your home and formulating the lawsuit that you have. Do not give yourselves. The, in September of 2020, there will be a change on the jurisdictional amount. That amount is going up to 20,000. What that means is credit card companies, businesses are gonna be suing people. If you don't have an attorney and you have a judge who doesn't understand the law, you will be in trouble because there's a tendency to believe the lawyer that's representing a company. I've represented nothing but small people. I've not, never represented big corporations. I have always represented those sometimes who have been unjustly accused. So I offer to this community my experience. I want to give back to this community what this community has given to me. Thank you. You've heard Ms. Morales. Our next candidate is Ms. Yendo. Ms. Monica Yendo. Good morning, everybody. My name is Monica Yendo. I am a candidate in the Zephyrine election for District 23, Precinct 1, Place 1. The JP Court is the People's Court. It is the most common spaces that people encounter. Um, I am one of you. I I'm a 41-year-old mother of three. I'm a daughter, a sister, a friend, too many. I'm also a certified Texas police officer. And I've been serving Webb County as a deputy sheriff under the Webb County Sheriff's Office for the past 11 years. Um, my goal is to give a sense of security in the JP court to have people feel comfortable in being there. I've dedicated my life to serving the community and I'm proud to say that it's something that was instilled in me as a child. And I hope that I can continue to assist the community and to treat everybody that walks into that courtroom with the respect and the attention that their specific situation is requiring at the time. I ask for your love. As Justice Ayla Pete, don't forget one of my members. Thank you. Thank you. You've heard Ms. Yendo. Now we're going to go ahead and hear Ms. Pettis. <laughs> Hi, everyone. 
everyone, I'm Mary Perez, and I'm going to give you a brief background about myself because I've never run for office before. I'm not a politician, and I'm not related to any politician, so most of you don't know who I am. I have a story of uh, struggle and triumph despite all obstacles. Um, I became a mom when I was 16 years old. When my mother went to speak to the principal, they told her that I could not attend school pregnant because since I was too popular, I was going to cause an epidemic or a trend. And so therefore, I, uh, the last grade I finished before I attended college was eighth grade. And um, through very hard struggles and a lot of hard work, and of course the help of my mother and my family, I was able to obtain my bachelor's degree, my associate's degree, and my master's degree in public administration. So I know the struggle of most of us because I know all of us, a lot of us at least have dealt you know, obstacles and have been thrown out and had to, you know, deal with our, our issues and work around them and fight them and defeat them and keep going. So I have that and um, I'm running for office because I'm ready, willing and able, completely able to make real positive change for our community. I have over 23 years of experience in the legal field as a paralegal. In fact, the most rewarding job as a paralegal I had was at Laredo Legal Aid. At Laredo Legal Aid, I was the, I was the formal advocate for low-income families in uh, social security disability cases and other uh, administrative hearings such as Texas Department of Human Services cases. So I'm very familiar with representing clients that are suffering in poverty against um, government entities, against any other, um, <laughs> I'm lost. Okay, so uh, the bottom line is I am ready and I want to represent the interests of everybody in our community and the interests of everybody that comes to our community and files cases there. I will be completely impartial, fair, and um, I will exercise the main thing that I want to bring to the office is restorative justice to help out our community and help out our youth. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bettis. And we're going to go ahead and start the questions. And the questions now are going to be one minute. Okay? For each answer. And we'll start off with Ms. Morales first. We'll go down the line. And then uh, we'll go ahead and continue. So I guess, you know, I guess I'll do this when it's 10 seconds before the minute for you guys to think. So we'll go through the first yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question for where it's coming from. The questions, like I said before, were gathered by regular folks, some attorneys, some teachers, some people that were concerned with issues that are coming up in the age, not only here, but across the board of the United States. So I said, okay. So we kind of collaged them all together and divided which was which. Okay? We placed it together. So the first question, and I'll explain a little briefing to kind of get where it's coming from. A justice of the peace may issue search and arrest warrants. Webb County has had the habit of entering into projects and lawsuits that are led by certain political views that will affect our future and are solely for the growth of a selected few. With a continual attack on the Second Amendment, many states, counties, and municipalities have introduced red flag laws. The question is, how do you feel about bringing forth warrants under a red flag law that will go against the constitutional rights of a person? 
That is an issue that I've dealt with a lot when I did uh, criminal defense work, and, it, and it, it's now it has the name of a red flag law, but there's always been in law enforcement what we call they they kind of tag you. Uh, they'll put a little a little something note in your record to show whether or not you, let's say for example, that you have been, your record has been expunged, so you think that nobody knows that it's been expunged, but in reality, there's been situations where that issue is always gonna come up as far as law enforcement is concerned. I would put, I am a firm believer of the Second Amendment. I believe that we have the right to bear arms as we are guaranteed by the Constitution. And I would put anyone that comes before me, any law enforcement agency, I would insist that they, you know, dot their I's and cross their T's, that they do have basis for that warrant. And there are guidelines that we must follow as judges. And that is, you must, there must be reasonable cause to believe. And what is that reasonable cause? So I would put anyone that seeks any warrants under that provision, under those, because it's not just one set of laws, it's gonna be a very different set of laws, uh, that, they would, that they would have to prove to the court that they do have the grounds and the basis for obtaining a warrant. Thank you, Ms. Morales. Our next in line would be Ms. Monica Allende, and it's very important for everybody to understand what the answers are. Listen carefully, please, Candy, because it's you all, the voter, that's going to be bringing forth change. Again? Um, the red flag law. It is a warrant for the temporary removal of a firearm uh, by a law enforcement officer or family member. Um, as a peace officer, I understand the responsibility of being in possession of a firearm and such priority is security. And once a warrant comes across the desk of a justice of the peace, it has already been investigated by the DA's office and been approved by the attorneys of the DA's office. So I wouldn't have a problem with issuing the warrant. I would go over it and make sure that everything is justified. And I believe that there are several cases where um, somebody's mental state is a big issue. And so we would take that into consideration and issue the temporary removal and then review it after a set amount of time. Thank you. Thank you. We have heard Ms. Siendo. Now we're going to go ahead and hear Ms. Spanish. First of all, as uh, judicial candidates, uh, we have an, an obligation to follow the duties of the Texas Judicial Code of Conduct. We are forbidden to give you our opinion on cases that might present before our court because people may reasonably be able to deduct what, what and how we're going to rule on a certain case, and that is forbidden by Texas, uh, the Texas Judicial Code of Conduct. However, I'm going to give you as much as I think I can, <laughs> uh, subject to that rule, that uh, law. I think that if a case comes to my court in which they want to remove the permission of a person who is considered an imminent threat, um, and it is proven beyond reasonable doubt that that person is an imminent threat to our community or to the government or to whoever, then I don't think that person should be permitted to carry a gun. Otherwise, I think all of us have the right to carry our guns and to be protected and to protect. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pettis. You've heard Ms. Ms. Pettis. Our next candidate is Ms. Lapaz. Hello. Um, I believe that every case is different and every situation has to be dealt different. And I, uh, if the, uh, the district attorney has established that uh, an element of crime exists, uh, I'm assuming that the constitutionality of it has been determined 
So I would probably abide by what the district attorney recommends. Thank you. You've heard each of the candidates and you've heard their answers. We'll continue to point down. The next, this court deals with that with true innocence. Okay? It deals a lot with our kids, with our youth. And that is also very important. So on the next set of rounds, the first person, that, the first candidate that's going to come out to ask will be Ms. Ms. Viendo. So I'm going to go ahead and say the question of where it comes from, and then Ms. Viendo can proceed. We understand that the court hears truancy cases. We're also told that drugs are a major reason many fail to go to school. And we know that drugs have no prejudice on any social barrier. That being the case, how are you going to deal with a truancy case that drugs are the main issue? Um, truancy due to drug use um, is a very delicate matter. I think that the health and safety of the student is what is most important. Um, I would address it possibly uh, working closer with the schools, with the counselors, um, maybe providing them resources, nonprofit organizations that are licensed to deal with substance abuse. Um, once a truancy case gets to the DP office, it's gone through a long process. And sometimes that process takes too long to where you would not be able to stop the problems or, or provide them help and the problem is just going to progress. So I would like to set maybe status hearings on their jersey, on the way that they're progressing with the problem and hopefully try to to become help them become successful and address their their situation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate will be the best. So I would be 100% hands on to help these youth with their drug issue. I would also use the burden to rehab, drug rehab, and intensive counseling. Um, I would also conduct my own research to determine what is the best way to help them with their drug issues. I would visit their families at their houses, talk to their counselor and their teacher to get all the information required so that I can make a complete assessment of the situation and conduct appropriate research and find evidence-based solutions that are scientifically proven to work and help these children that have an issue with drug use in Laredo. Thank you. Thank you. You've heard Ms. Bendis, now we'll continue with Mr. Bass. Mr. Bass? Hello. Uh, being that we, we live in the border, uh, drugs are a big issue in, in, in our schools, in our communities. And I believe that there, I mean, I know that programs such as SCAN are able to help our, our kids with uh, drug abuse or, and I think that implementing positive approach programs that would help um, our, our kids to stay away from drugs. The other thing would be, uh, since the uh, criminalization, uh, is no longer a criminal uh, act, it's more of a civil matter. I know that the, uh, the state has, uh, given the school districts tools to be able to handle truancy before it gets to, you know to court. So I'm assuming that a drug program in, uh, or in, uh, like uh, Ms. Perez said, counseling, uh, getting the family involved, uh, the same goes, uh, it takes a village to raise a, a child. So we all in the community have to take part in it to make it, you know, uh, a better quality of life for it, for our kids and our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Our next candidate will be Ms. Morales. Counselor? I intend to be a proactive judge. 
What, what does that mean? That means that within the law, at the way it changed in 2015, you have the cases, the school district is tasked with having a program that would prevent them from going, prevent those students from escalating their truancy and being absent to the 10 days that it's required for them to go to the Justice of the Peace Court. Once they get to the court and the case is filed and everything else didn't succeed, then the judge has under the law certain things that they can do under the code. One of them, of course, deals with find out what is the root of the problem. I intend, I have two plans in action. One is I call be counted. That is a preventive plan where you go to the schools, you talk to the students, you talk to the administration, find out what, what is it that they need help with that their program is not accomplishing. Is it referring them to a drug program? There are drug programs, but don't, there, are, there is a lot of lack of programs. I would seek out funds from wherever they're available to do a program that is specifically geared to the issue of truancy and drugs. That's my big counted program. If they do end up in court and you end up sending them to rehab, because that's one of the things you can do under the law as a judge, then I have what I call, I counted. I'm proud that I finished the program, that I went through this, that I am now a graduate of high school. In that program, my idea is I'm gonna seek monies from private enterprise, from private businesses to have a scholarship fund so they would be geared, those scholarships will be geared to the students that finish their program, their truancy program, according to what the judge imposed on them. We first, we first the second question, now we're going to go for the third question. And the third question is the Many will agree that prosperity to have to is, is an assimilation of the betterment of life and the basic joys of life. And by that, we get it through an education. <coughs> now, missing an education is part of what truancy is. Our kids are not being educated. Many of them do not go to school because of financial distress within the household. So the question is, how are you going to deal with a truancy case that deals with a student not being able to attend because of the harsh, hardships of the family financially? Well, that hits home because I have personally experienced poverty. It's difficult. Um, I would refer the family and the student to programs that's designed specifically to help them uh, monetary-wise or uh, training, giving, them, giving the parents education to perhaps get a better paying job. Um, additionally, I would talk to the child or, or teenager and tell him about my personal struggle and how I overcame those obstacles and how he can or she can find the power within herself or himself to turn things around and change his or her surroundings and succeed. Additionally, I am donating $20,000 of my first year's salary that will be devoted to the reduction of poverty in our community. As many of us already know, our community in Laredo suffers with the third highest poverty rate in the nation. And um, approximately 85%, I mean 85,000 Laredo ends live below the federal poverty level. And we're not talking about the ones that don't live below the federal poverty level. We're only talking about the ones at the very bottom. And that is also about 85,000 people about 35 or 36,000 of them are children. So it's a huge problem in our community. And I plan to attack it and tackle it 
personally in the court, talking to the children, the family, referring them to counseling, referring them to educational programs, and by donating twenty thousand dollars of my my own uh, first year salary to open up a nonprofit organization dedicated to reduce poverty in our community. I think it's a special and that's one of the biggest issues in our court and in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Page. Ms. Gendel? Unfortunately, hardships are an issue that a vast majority of the students in the school system are, are dealing with. Um, I would have my staff um, available to provide to the families information on how they can get assistance. There's lots of programs that provide assistance um, with utilities, with expenses. Um, I would want to keep the program that are already being implemented as far as the students with food and um, work closely with the school system because uh, lots of times there's students in the high school level that are working and they work late hours and they don't wake up to make it to school because they're trying to help out their family. And I think that possibly suggesting um, maybe online schooling at home to where they can still get their studies in and not have to be truant because of it. Um, I think that would be something to look into and just get to the root of, of where the hardship is coming from and working closely with the schools to try and fix that. Thank you. Thank you. You heard Ms. Yendo, now we're going to hear from Councilor Morales. Ms. Morales? No child should have to miss school because they have to work. That is a no no. Under the truancy law, if you have a child that's 16 years or older, the judge can order them to go take a GED, for example, if they insist on going to school, on not going to school and working. The problem is between 12 and 16 that your alternatives are limited. That's from my experience as a lawyer who has done countless of children their child support comes in. I would insist on the referral to the Attorney General's office so that those children between the age of 12 and 16 should get child support for whatever parent is responsible. That is my plan. You make sure that the Attorney General listens to those people. Anybody who has dealt with the Attorney General realizes that there's a lot of problems by laws. My program is simply have a program that specifically says you're between 12 and 16, you need to get your child support so that you don't have to work to support your family. Thank you, Ms. Morales. Now we'll hear from our candidate, Mr. Fuss. Um, again, it takes the whole community to get involved, and especially now that there's a lot of uh, single parent families that struggle, and um, you know, just to make ends meet. And I, I know that uh, there's grant money available where we could get, you know, a caseworker in the school district and see what the root of the problem is and involve everybody that, that you know programs, uh, school districts, and uh, try to help out these uh, people in need. Well, thank you. <laughs> we've heard our candidates, you know, great answers. Now we're gonna go to the last one, which is small claims. The district that you all represent is by, it's a vital district to our county. And due to the position where you are located, there's not only a lot of commercial businesses, there's a lot of residential as well. We also know that Webb County is also one of the poorest counties in Texas. And your court hears what many say up to 10,000. We've already talked about that there's that's a controversy right now at this time. 
But the question is, we have way too many people leaving leases and vacancies everywhere. So we're losing businesses. So we're going to look at that in general. And the question is, so how are you going to implement change and introduce, introduce new methods, methods to interest small businesses to continue moving forward instead of breaking leases? We'll start off with what? Uh, this is una, it's un problema that's dear to my heart because I have represented so many people that are sued by the land, the landlord supposedly to oust them out of their homes. When in fact, it's not a landlord tenant problem, when in fact, it's a matter that they had a contract to buy the home. And once they're almost done buying the home, the landlord said, or the owner says, oh no, you didn't pay me on time, so you're my tenant, I'm getting you out. You'd be surprised how many cases are like that. I understand real estate law. I understand that there's a difference between being a landlord and a tenant and being an owner because you're purchasing, purchasing the property. So my plan there is I will ascertain with every case that comes in that in fact, there, there is a landlord-tenant relationship, not one of buying the property and not being able to pay it for a few months, and then they want to get you out. That's one of my, I, like I said, it's dear to my heart, because so many people are losing their properties that they bought because they get sued saying that they're tenants. Uh, I think that landlord tenant issues um, should be judged fairly because like Mr. Witton said that some uh, landlords you know miss out on their business but at the same time there has to be some compassion for the tenants and I think that the best thing to do as a judge sitting there is to you know each circumstance is different but to try to be as fair as possible so both sides you know can come out ahead. Thank you. 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 Unfortunately, yes, our court has a lot of tenant evictions, landlord tenant evictions. And what I would do to help fix the issue with those cases is make certain that the tenants have forms available online to answer those petitions for eviction because a lot of the time, since they cannot afford an attorney, they don't answer. And automatically that becomes a default judgment. So they take their home automatically because they didn't show up to court because they didn't answer the petition. I am very familiar with property law, Texas property law for the past about six years and a half. Six years and a half maybe. I worked as a paralegal with a real estate attorney here in Laredo and I conducted a lot of research. So I'm very familiar with the rights of tenants versus the rights of homeowners. Of course, we don't get homeowner cases in our court because we don't have jurisdiction to hear those foreclosure cases. And so that's one of the ways, specifically making sure that the tenants have access to answers that they can just come and fill out or fill them out at their home in the convenience of their home and bring them in and make sure that, that we don't have to take a default judgment without having them you know, there and explain their issues and maybe perhaps try and make an agreement with, with the landlord and make small payments. Um, the other thing I plan to do is make sure that they have ample time, like, um, that they have ample time to find another place or just to move out. Uh, so that their move out of their homes is not rushed and, and fast and, and more difficult than it has to be. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Now we'll hear Ms. Yendo. Ms. Yendo. 
In reference to landlord tenant issues, um, the laws are already implemented. We're not there to make new laws. We can't do that. Um, but um, I believe that the landlords should be aware of the laws as well as the tenant. And once that case is brought to the Justice Ministry's Court, he will make a ruling accordingly. If they can come to an agreement as far as payments are concerned, um, that would be heard during that hearing and the decision would be made there. As far as them getting information or uh, wanting to know more about their case, uh, the Justice of the Peace Court cannot provide that information due to the legality of it. But the constable's office can be the mediator between the two and they can give the tenant the information that they're seeking. And so we would work closely with our constable's office as well. You've heard the answers to the questions. Now we're going to go ahead and start with the rebuttal. And the rebuttal is going to be the first person to be up in this paper. You have two minutes. Well, I'm not a rebuttal. Okay, so I have over 23 years of experience in the legal field, and I am certain, as most attorneys and people in the legal field know, that it is an absolute necessity in a position like this where you have to deal with laws um, as a judge and make life changing decisions. Sometimes you can ruin lives and sometimes you can help lives. And so it is very important. I think that that's one of my assets. My other asset is that I live the personal struggle of a lot of, of a, the kind that a lot of the people that will go before me have. And so I understand them and I know how to help, how to help, especially the youth find a way to survive and to break those obstacles and to come through, you know? It's possible, it's doable, it's, doable, it's difficult, but it can be done. Additionally, I want to implement this restorative justice in this case, which is something unique that no one else has mentioned and or plans to implement, which this restorative justice is a supplemental justice that focuses on Number one, restoring the victim of the crime. Number two, restoring the community of the crime. Number three, geez, I forgot. <laughs> number three is, I don't remember, but number four <laughs> is we have to, we have to make certain that we rehabilitate these offenders and that they don't, commit the same mistakes that they make. That's one of the most important issues also in this court because these cases, I want you all to remember, none of the cases, none of the criminal cases that come into our court go to jail. None of them result in incarceration. They're all class C misdemeanors. These are the beginning cases of crime. So it is a huge responsibility on that judge, on myself if I am the next judge to make certain that these people that come before me for minor offenses do not graduate to the higher court and commit higher crimes or worse crimes. I want to target that issue, whatever it is, that root cause of the problem that brought them here before me. I want to target that, fix it as much as possible, and make certain that they get help and rehabilitation because they will stop, and we want them to stop committing these, these, these issues, these crimes. We don't want them to commit any higher crimes, and we want our community to continue staying safe as much as possible and look for our community to thrive. So basically, restore the victim, restore the community. Oh, repair the harm, I remember. Repair the harm, there you go, number three. And number four, we have the offender so that it stops there. No more. That's enough. This is how you're going to do it. This is how you're going to change. I know how to do it. I know how to show you. I know where to refer you. I know how to conduct the research to make sure that we use methods that work 
that are scientifically proven to work so that you don't do it again. Hopefully it works for most people, but science says that it does. So thank you so much. We heard, we heard Ms. Pettis, and I'll add another minute to everybody's rebuttal. Sorry. Ms. Diendo. Sorry. I won't So all the issues that we've discussed today are just a few that the justice of the peace <coughs> in tears and come to pass. Um, there's lots of cases that come through those doors, and it's the most common and the cases that people will deal with all the time, traffic citation, small claims, run with pending issues, emergency protective orders, um, small civil disputes, all of that will come across the desk of the Justice of the Peace. And my main priority is to be there to listen and to attend their everybody in the most professional manner and to be fair and just. And I intend to help the community. Whatever they need, I want the community to feel like they can come to my court with whatever problem, be it something having to do with the issues that are faced there or a personal problem, someone where they can go to get help. That is what I'm about. And I've always served my community and I want to continue to do so. You heard the general now we'll go ahead and hear a council council. I came today with specific ideas, with specific plans for the problems that that are facing our community. I don't have this, I'm gonna help everybody. I have specific plans. When you come to court, you're nervous. You don't know what's going to happen. You want the judge to understand your problem. You want someone who knows the law. You want someone who's going to apply it fairly to you. That's what you want of a judge. So I offer that to the community because I've done so many little cases, not big cases, little cases, child support, a landlord tenant, a contracts, debts. We had a dead case where the hospital said they were owed so much money. Guess what? When we put the pencil to it, they owed her money. So you don't have a judge that understands those issues. And what does it mean for the hospital to come in with an affidavit saying, this is what they owe me. 20,000 is going to be the limit in September. A lot of companies are going to be suing people in Justice and Peace Court. What I promise to you is I will hear the case, I will be impartial, and I will be fair. Because, and I will innovate the office, and innovate la oficina para tener un website, tener las formas en inglés y en español para que ustedes puedan utilizarlas, para que ustedes puedan entender. Y ustedes quieren, en, en la ley hay un, un dicho que dice, justice delayed is justice denied. What I plan and the plans that I have for all these type of cases is to be efficient, to move the docket, and to make a resolution. Have you uh, make a resolution so that you can go on with your lives? And that's why I believe that I'm the best candidate for this position. Gracias. God bless America. You've heard Ms. Morales, now we'll go ahead and hear Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. After working for the fire department for 27 years, I know the burdens of my community. I've been witness, firsthand witness of, you know, the living conditions, uh, when people are in distress, and I have the experience of, of being able to see firsthand what goes on in our community. And as we all know, this is the people's court. And if I am elected, I, I will show honesty, accountability, and integrity. Um, and, I, and I've always believed that uh, public service is a noble profession, and that's why I want to make a difference in my community. Thank you.
Well, we didn't hear no rebuttals, but we did hear a great closing. So, that's, that's right. so we'll go ahead and take that as a closing. But I want to say a couple of things here. Is I want to thank you all for standing up because it takes a lot of courage to sign your name on that dotted line. Everybody wants to make change, but very few actually stand up and try to do it. And actually, you all are going to be placing a robe on in the near future if one of you makes it. That robe represents one of the greatest judges who was King Solomon. So you have to go once, a, once on top of the tribunal. You have to sit down. You have to have a level of judgment. You can't be there to prejudice one from the other. So that's very important. You know, that you have a little wooden <coughs> gavel. Somebody made it, somebody carved it out, it's just a piece of wood. But when it goes, it can change the life of many. So once more, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank you all for, for showing up. And I want to thank you all for trying to become a public official making change. So <laughs> Following political paid advertisements do not reflect the political opinions of the program or its associates. Any political campaign or candidate who wishes to purchase advertising can do so. Advertising is open to all on behalf of Gloves Off.
Gloves Off is always on point. On point. Bringing you the best on current issues, community affairs, and the happenings around us. This segment of Gloves Off is brought to you by the best. So pay them a visit. Check them out. This is Gloves Off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 